Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. My name is Barrett Louie, part of the marketing team here at Risk IQ, and we're excited you were able to join us today. We'll be exploring methodologies for threat analysis, walk through a domain infringement investigation with our I3 team, and work through hands-on exercises. Before we get started, there are a couple housekeeping notes. First, today's workshop is being recorded. Second, today's session will be interactive. Throughout the workshop, we'll be unmuting lines for questions and conversation. If you have a question while your line is muted, please send them through the questions window in the GoToWebinar control panel. The team will answer as many as we can as we go. Now let me introduce you to the team that's here to support you today. First, Benjamin Powell. Benjamin is RiskIQ's Director of Technical Marketing and will be leading today's workshop with Jordan, who is a Senior Threat Intel Analyst from our I3 team, and Josh, who is the I3 team's Lead Threat Analyst. Finally, we have our Solutions Architect, Caroline Yoon, here to help answer any questions you may have. And with that, I'll hand it over to Benjamin. Hi everyone, thank you for uh, joining us today. So um, from previous workshops, we asked, what would you like to see? And you wanted to see some real active types of investigations and takedowns and, and ask questions about takedowns. So I invited our I3 team, um, some members from there to talk to us today to explain what they do because what we show in the workshops is only part of an investigation. And there's other aspects that you might not even think about um, that they're gonna go through and talk about. So this is gonna be a really um, very cool um, um, workshop. And I wanna make sure that you ask questions. Now I'm gonna do some housekeeping real quick. If you can't hear us or you have some problems with the audio or the video, if you exit and come back in, that generally fixes it. So I just wanna let you know that up front. Also, um, we're gonna be doing some active searches inside of Passive Total. So inside of Passive Total, um, if, you if you're not currently in a trial and you don't have a paid license, you can add a promo code. And the promo code is on every single slide. Um, today's promo code is VRTHW-I3. It's case sensitive. And I'm gonna show you how to put that in uh, and explain that in just a minute. So um, with inside of our system, we have two different types of free accounts. One based upon a free email, like a Gmail or Yahoo type of email account. And then an email account that is based on an organizational email. And if you have an organizational email, we can consider you a uh, trusted security professional and we actually give you um, extra data and extra um, visibility into our data sets and the reason for that is if you can find out where a particular port or service uh, is running everywhere in the world you could potentially um, that could be used for bad and so in the past we didn't do that but if you use a corporate email account we we trust that you're a, a real security professional and we give you that data now, if you're in the enterprise trial or with this promo code, the promo code I'm giving you today is going to last for seven days. If you start an enterprise trial, that lasts 30 days. Um, and with that, you'll get every single data set and you'll get all of the history, going back to the beginning of when we started, over 10 years worth of history in some cases, depending on the IP or the domain. So please make sure that um, if you kick off an enterprise trial, you're gonna have it for 30 days. If you don't um, have an enterprise trial going, or if you um, have one that is expired, you can add the promo code, and that promo code will give you uh, enterprise access for seven days, okay? So with that, if you haven't um, yet created an account in Passive Total, you go out to community.riskiq.com slash registration, and during that process, you can add the promo code. But if you already have an account, um, we will um, go through how you can add that. What you can do is once you log into Passive Total, in the upper right hand corner, there is a account settings section under the little icon of the person. Uh, you can go to promo code under profile and you can cl click on the little pencil and that's where you add the promo code. And please make sure it's case sensitive that you enter it um, VRTHW-I3. And once you put it in there and you click off of that, that field, you'll see that your API queries and the total amount of queries that you can perform will jump up dramatically. Now, 
another section I want to bring your attention to inside of here is the email notification frequency. Now that we have a threat portal where we actually have articles that we're doing research and, and extending other people's research, uh, we email those out sometimes. And you can put down the frequency that you want to get that. So if you feel like you're being spammed and you don't want it, you can change it. Or if you want to get them weekly or daily, you can adjust those frequencies. Now inside of projects, if you have monitors going, sometimes you want to be um, updated daily or weekly when changes occur to the things that you're tracking. And this is where you can, you can adjust all those fields are under the account settings. So today we're going to be using um, Risk IQ tools and other open source tools. So what I wanted to do was to list them all out. And what I'll do is um, I will paste these into the chat windows so you can have them uh, right away and you can click on them to see um, how to get there and what they are. So as we go through these exercises, before we begin, I will be pasting those in there. Uh, also, uh, we're going to record this and this will be up on YouTube shortly afterwards. And all of the slides that we're, we're doing today um, will be um, sent out to everyone that attended today. Uh, we'll create a PDF and send those out. So you'll get a copy of these slides. Okay. Now, a little bit of background on myself. I'm Benjamin Powell, the Director of Technical Marketing here at Risk IQ. Um, I've worked um, running security teams and network teams in all different areas of, of organizations, uh, in state government, uh, airports, uh, uh, port district, uh, education, biotech companies, financial services, manufacturing, and software development. And then I moved over to do um, um, working for startups in Silicon Valley in San Francisco. So that's, that's where I've been for um, probably half of my time. So one fun fact about myself is I enjoy spearfishing. And behind me, you might see some spear guns on my wall. But when I tell that to people in our industry, they don't want to take my emails anymore. But I actually swim in the ocean and catch fish. And this is my, my latest catch I, I did uh, just recently. And down below are my contact information if you want to um, connect on uh, LinkedIn or, or email me. Okay. So now I'll turn this over to Jordan to introduce herself. Hi all, my name is Jordan. I'm one of the senior threat intel analysts on the i3 team, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later on during the presentation today. Um, I've got a background in analysis and investigation. Um, and a fun fact about me is I actually used to host my own radio show. Awesome, thank you. And then Josh, um, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Uh, sure, my name's Josh. Um, as I stated before, we're on the MIS team. I'm actually the uh, escalations lead for that team. So I just work with anything that um, if traditional efforts aren't being successful with takedowns, then usually send them my way. Okay. And, and please make sure everyone that um, we want to make this interactive. So if you have a question, we're going to stop and we're going to answer it. So if you don't understand what we're doing or what how we came to a conclusion, or you just want to ask us a, a question that, that's on topic, we will make sure that we, we stop and we, we answer it. We want to make it interactive. So when we look at what we're gonna be doing today, um, I'm gonna to show you how to be a little proactive. A lot of times uh, in our fields, we're reactive. Something happens and we take action, we have to investigate, take something down. But I wanna show you how to turn the tide a little bit and the tables and look at something that is good and find things that are bad. So then you can apply this to your own organizations or friends' organizations to be able to look at their infrastructure and by researching the infrastructure, you will find bad things that link to it. And then you can take action and hopefully prevent a, an exposure or prevent a breach that, that happens. Uh, so we'll go through and explain that. Now, I3 is gonna talk about, uh, or Jordan's gonna talk about an investigation and attribution. Now, generally when we do these workshops, we never get into attribution like who's behind this because it's it's not something that you generally do in our tool. We find the infrastructure and link it together. And you need a skilled professional to really understand the full aspect of how to identify the who's who's behind the, um, the attack. Is it an individual? Is it a nation state? Is it a threat actor group? Um, and that's beyond what I do. And so that's why it's so cool to have Jordan and Josh here because this is their expertise. Uh, these are the things that, uh, in our own jobs, 
we don't generally um, get to the attribution phase and we might need to leverage somebody like I3 to help with those types of aspects to get all that down. Now, Josh is here to keep us honest and to talk about takedowns. Like a lot of people want to know, now that I found this bad infrastructure, okay, what do I do next? Because we're not really familiar with doing that process or what it takes. And that's why we have Josh here. And then um, I'm going to show you how to leverage the exposed services and to search on components to find out bad um, or vulnerable infrastructure that's out there. So if a zero day um, announcement comes out, you can look to see how that impacts the world or impacts your organization. And I'll be able to show you how to do that. And then we also have a, um, a resource section under our, our page, under riskiq.com, if you go to threat-hunting-resources, we have recordings of use cases and step-by-step -step guides from previous workshops we've done. Uh, even some of the bookmarks that we use are, are listed there. So this is another resource that you can use if you want to extend um, what we've done in these workshops. So before we begin, um, we like to do some polling questions. And the reason why we do these polling questions is we want to understand who you are. Because when we talk to you or explain what we're doing, we can um, give the perspective that you're used to. And uh, if you're a vulnerability person or if you're a SOC analyst, your perspective will be a little bit different and what's important to you is different. And we wanna make sure that we're addressing the types of questions that you might be thinking about. So Barrett, if you can, can you please start the polling questions and then we'll, we'll understand uh, where to go from here. So the first question is, we wanna know um, what area do you work in your organization? Is it incident response, vulnerability management or SOC? And we have SOC twice, so it's so important we wanna make sure which which SOC it is. So we have a, a little mistake there, but basically one of those three. Okay, so we have about 19% are in the SOC, um, about 19% in vulnerability management, and the rents, rest are at instant response. So this is great, okay? So I'll make sure that we hit the uh, vulnerability management piece um, to talk about the services and things like that. Okay. Okay, so the next question is, I wanna find out what type of account you have. Do you have the free email account, the free corporate email account, or a paid account? Okay, about 78 are the, the corporate email, that's wonderful, and about 11% are the free email. So if you if you just create one with a corporate email, you'll immediately get, instead of 14 days of history, you're gonna get 90 days of history, and you're gonna get an extra data set that um, you don't get for the free account. So it's a good idea to do that. And then we have about 11% are, are, are enterprise paid accounts, so wonderful. Okay, what type of investigations would you like to see in the future? Would you like to see a malware investigation, a mage cart, data vi visualization, um, um, and even and in the chat, if you if you like to see phishing as well, we can um, phishing is generally one that we do as well. But it's not listed in the question, so if you want to see that, just put it in the chat. Okay, so we see about 64% want to see about malware. 28% about MageCart and about 8% want to be able to see how to visualize the data that we have. So um, that's something we can do with like Maltigo. We can show how, how to do that, okay? Okay, is your organization utilizing RiskIQ digital footprint? And the reason why I'm asking this, it's, a, it's another product that we have that shows your attack surface. Um, so we map the entire internet, know how everything's interconnected, but we can show you your piece of the internet, what things you actually own and control and the things that you link to to do your business. And this is everything externally facing. So um, we also have a free snapshot that you can, um, um, you can get to understand what you have out there. And this is a, um, a really cool thing with a, you can even, uh, if you buy the digital footprint, it's an active inventory that constantly is updating and changing to show you what you have. So we have a 90, 91% don't um, have that. Um, 
9% do. Okay. Okay. Uh, when when would you feel comfortable attending a person uh, an in person workshop in the future? And the reason why we're asking this is we're looking for um, next year to see when is the appropriate time to start doing these back in person. Um, so please let us know if it's going to be this year, uh, first quarter of next year, or, or when it would occur that you would feel comfortable attending. Okay. So majority of you is the third quarter of next year. Okay, this is kind of what we've seen in the past. Okay, great. Does your organization need help conducting threat attribution, analysis, investigations, or none of the above? Um, the reason why we're asking is I3, that's what they do. And we wanna see if, once, um, if, if you even thought about those types of services, Threat, uh, threat attribution, analysis, okay. So about 45% would, would think about using services like that. Okay, all right. Which of the following is the most important to your organization? Um, executive protection, uh, getting a holistic view of your organization's cyber vulnerabilities, um, or um, tracking domain infringement? So about 20% executive protection, 50% to get um, a holistic view of your organization's cyber vulnerabilities, and 30% domain infringement. Okay. And that's that completes the polls, Benjamin. Okay. Hey, was there the poll question um, if they've used risk uh, passive total before? I didn't see that one pop up. Uh, that one is not in there today. Can we add one in there real quick? Because I just want to know what level of the audience we have. Give me a second here. We may need to revisit. Okay. So um, generally, we have a qu poll question that, that got dropped. But generally, I'd like to find out if you have used passive total or not. So I know what level of detail I need to get into more general, or I can go down to the weeds and show you some other things. So um, I'll consider that it's like 50-50, so then I'll, I won't go too wide and I won't go too deep. Okay. okay. So let me give you a little bit of a background on what Risk IQ does and how we gather this data and how we make it available to the public. So we go out and we, we scan the entire IP4 space, all the IP addresses. We don't do it, we don't hit every IP every single day, but um, over a short period of time, a, a couple days, a week, we will hit everything. And when a new domain gets purchased, we start monitoring those domains. Once it gets parked, then we hit those. those, And then once there's content on there, we're, we're seeing those. So there's a little priority that to find some of the new stuff a lot faster. Now, we go out there and we gather this data like a real user. We visit the website. Um, we interact with the website, we bring that data down, we pull down the full document object model, we look at over 220 different ports, we come out from over 150 countries, and we, we, we source from commercial, residential, and mobile IP space, imitating every type of browser, device, application, operating system. The reason why we do this is that if we came from our own IP space, then somebody can block us and say, oh, I'm just gonna filter out any requests that are coming from this IP range. And then we wouldn't see anything and we would say the internet is clean and everything is good. Um, so we actually have to um, do kind of what the threat actors do. So with everything that we do, it's because threat actors have changed and um, tried to block us from understanding what they're doing. So for example, came from our own data centers, they filtered us, we go through proxies now. And now we can see some data. Now they're starting, they were filtering to say, we only want to attack certain regions or certain types of devices. So we have to appear that we come from all those places 
So we act like the intended victim. So we generally act like your parents on the internet, clicking on things, going places, doing things to try to find all the bad stuff or have the bad stuff happen so then we can identify it. So that's, that's kind of what we do. Now we act like a real user. We might go to a search engine. We will we'll create a search, we'll have cookies, we'll keep session. Um, when we go to a, uh, a website, we might not pull everything from that one session. We might have multiple browsers from different parts of the world going in and grabbing that data and then assembling it in the back end. So with that, we bring in a lot of information like the document object model, the links, the console messages, the cookies, the headers, the dependent requests, the files, all that information is in our back end and we have it. And then we cut that up and that becomes our data sets. So with that, we have an active map of the internet and every day it changes. And we know all the relationships, what's coming in and what's going out of all the sites that we're talking to. And we can see well, the first time we saw something or the last time we saw something. So if there was a certain version of software running and then it got patched and now there's a new version, we'll know when it was first installed, when it was patched and when the new one took over. We see all these things. We do billions of HTTP requests every day. Um, we have terabytes of passive DNS information. And one of the reasons why we can do this is that um, we, um, we, we, we build this, this, this map and we collect this data that we know how it's all linked together because we've collected, it's not feeds that we're doing. Um, so it's really important to, to be able to do this. So what that gives us the capability is what we call infrastructure chaining, because we already have these maps and we know how they all pivot and relate to each other, that you can start with a single piece of malware, for example. And with that, we can say that malware is on this IP, that IP has this cert on there, that cert is also related to another IP, another domain, and there's some tracking information with that, domains and, and certs, and it builds out the chain. So you can see the complete picture of what's out there. That's what Risk IQ gives you, is that that infrastructure chain and how it changes over time. Um, now, what we found is when we talk to anal uh, analysts and, and SOC people and vulnerability people, what will happen is a op uh, an open source intelligence article would come out. It would talk about some threat. And what they would do is they would look at the threat and then they would come to passive total and start searching for all the things in there to see if there's any more infrastructure that wasn't um, published in the article or maybe the investigator didn't know about. So we found out about 80% um, of queries for people doing that would use the product were this type of, of query. But what happens is in these articles, they try to make them sticky. Um, their published information might be in a photograph, an image where you can't copy and paste. Or it might be a lot of data where you have to copy and paste and do things. So what we did was we created the threat intel portal. And the threat intel portal is all the bad stuff that's been published and is out there. We take all those indicators that are in these articles uh, and we make them available. You can just click on it and see them in passive total. And those are called community indicators. Now, to help the, the, the community, what we've done is we have our own analysts that go through and take those articles and find additional infrastructure that wasn't published or has changed since publication, and that becomes the enterprise indicators. So this is what um, we found that a lot of people were doing was they're taking those community indicators and trying to build the bigger picture with all the infrastructure, and we call that the enterprise indicators. So what that gives us the capability is as we took this information and created this portal, we can start with those initial community indicators and then immediately show you the full picture. So it already jumpstarts your investigations to see that full extent, and it saves hours of your day going through these articles trying to do it. You can immediately look at them, look at the uh, enterprise indicators, and you can even download them. Now these enterprise indicators are available to the, the paid users or people that are in trials. Um, but you can suck those into your CrowdStrike, Splunk, different types of, of SIMs and make that available immediately into your system without having to type anything. And sometimes there's even Yara rules and things like that that we publish.
So it gives us the ability to, to go back in time and see that full history, how the internet has changed over time and how these threat actors have evolved. We can see that. So we do this at scale. So as we go out and collect this data and capture it, we put it into a global inventory. And that inventory becomes the, um, the map that, we, that links everything together. Now, we also have other products like Digital Footprint that we mentioned earlier that can show you your attack surface, your piece of the internet, and all the relationships that you have and then the resources that you rely upon. So as that data comes in, um, we're looking at on average 250,000 new domain resolutions a day, uh, 55 million new host resolutions every day. Uh, we have over 106 billion plus unique DNS records. Uh, we do about 2 billion web requests a day. We see about 300,000 new port observations every day. Uh, 300 million uh, mobile app stores were going and, and looking at their stuff, sandboxing it, seeing what's happening. And in our database, we have over 34 million mobile apps. In uh, a previous Threat Engine workshop, um, we actually went through and looked at some of those apps and showed what we have. Now, as that data comes in, um, think of it this way. Um, we take yesterday's aggregate and everything that we collected today, and we merge it together. When we merge it together, um, we can go back in time and create a new data set and bring it forward, or we can look for something and uh, tag it going forward. So we can either roll it back to the beginning of time and roll it forward, um, or we can look at it from this point forward. So a security researcher or an analyst might find uh, a new bad thing out there, a new, uh, a new cookie value, uh, a new component, a new piece of thing that, that JavaScript, something that can identify this threat actor. So with that, the, the data scientists take that and make it so we can do it at scale. And then that comes in and then we, we merge all that data in and then we create the data sets from what we collected from the document object model and the other things that we found. So that gives us the who is, the passive DNS, the crawl information, the certificates, um, what services are there, the host pairs, which is what's coming and going out of every website, the web components, the trackers, the little bits of code that that um, like Google analytic codes, clicky IDs, things like that. Uh, we have the historic data, mobile apps, open source intelligence. And then we even have some feeds like blacklists. So like if we put something on our blacklist, Google and Microsoft will put that in production, no questions asked within 10 to 15 minutes. So 95% of the world's browsers won't go there. And then if you get takedown services, for example, something I3 can do, it takes about one to four days to go through and take that offline um, on average. And then there's lists like accomplice lists, which means that you might have some bad stuff linking to, or you might be referring to uh, scam lists, IOT, malware, domain infringement, IP reputation, spam lists. So we have all these things available. So what does that mean for your organization? So most organizations spend their time and effort um, from the firewall in, because that's what they can control and see. That's what they can they have visibility into. Well, Risk IQ focuses everything outside the firewall. So everything that's public, everything that's that you don't have any control or visibility into. That's what we're doing. So with somebody talking about, you know, does anybody have any um, credentials for this organization? We want to attack them. That's in the deep and dark web, and we have the capability of, of having that information. Um, and then when during the, the recon, the setup and weaponization, this is when uh, we see those, those assets like a typo squatted domain, which is not illegal, but the minute they have your logos on there, that's domain infringement. If it's email capable, it's now potentially phishing. And as those things change over time and we see that they've talked about stuff, it comes into a domain is registered, it's parked, oh, it's email capable or it has your, your logos in there. That's when we can do the takedowns, and we can generally do it about one to four days before it's really active and going after you. So we can we can stop it before it affects your customers or um, your workers. Okay, so um, we can generally stop it before it gets inside, and so that's why a lot of people use Risk IQ. Or if they see something on the inside, like with uh, an EDR, like CrowdStrike, for example. Um, they can investigate, find more of the infrastructure, and then take that information back into the system to make it um, work better and get that 360-degree visibility. And as things change over time, 
that the, you're playing whack-a-mole, so you take it down on one domain uh, or IP address and it pops up on another one, um, we can find it and take it down for you. And we have that capability. So the cool thing is that we all play on the same battlefield, okay? And with that, we all have to play by the same rules. And with that, that means we emit signals. And when we emit signals, if they're captured, we can correlate them together and we can do something. So for example, if you all go to um, an event and there's Wi-Fi and you all connect to the Wi-Fi and somebody at that event does something bad, they can go back in time and say, who was at that event? And they can look at the logs for the Wi-Fi and say, these are the machines that were connected to the Wi-Fi. Um, if there was a credit card transaction that was that was bad at a restaurant, they can go to that restaurant and say, give me those things. Are there any security cameras? Who was sitting here? And they can kind of piece that together. But think about it for the internet. If we have all this data, we know the map, we know what's happening. We're now able to go back and piece that together find the infrastructure, find all the bad things together. And all of these signals um, are, are ephemeral. They're gonna disappear. No one's there, no one collects it, can't do anything about it. So we're trying to be as, as uh, everywhere as we can to gather that data and give you a full complete picture. So when you think about a threat actor and a user, um, the threat actor, just from going online, they're gonna have an IP address, uh, they're gonna be network blocks, uh, autonomous system numbers, and an ISP, just from going online. The minute they start to do an email, then you're gonna get the email provider, there'll be a subject, there might be a language, date and timestamp, there could be attachments, all those things. And when they send that email, it's now gonna have transit IPs, network blocks, transit times, autonomous systems are gonna go through, and it goes to the targeted user. If it's an HTML, email, it might point back to infrastructure that is controlled by the threat actor where they can fingerprint the machine, uh, find out if they read it, uh, get some um, location information, um, understand more about that person that they're targeting, and even have it download code or do something. So these are all the signals that we're trying to, to gather and understand. So then as a, an investigator, whether you're looking at a vulnerability or you're looking at a threat to an executive, to an organization, to an application, to a customer, you're able to piece all these things together. And with that, the passive DNS, the who is, the certificates, the trackers, all of these things link together to give you that map. And we're able to do that. But there's always caveats. Can't be everywhere at once. So for example, the threat actor compromises a, a place and we've scanned it and then they compromise it and then they it, they take off their stuff before we can scan it again. Did it really happen? Yes, but we might not have seen it. So there's always um, blind spots. So with that, we always wanna have uh, solid analytical leads and we always say you need about three to really make a good determination. So if somebody's using a free certificate authority, is that does that mean it's bad? No but it's suspicious. If it's a typo squatted domain, is it bad? That doesn't mean so. They might not have your logos or images on there, but when you have two of those together, that's that's really suspicious. Now, um, if it has your it has a logo on there that doesn't, that's, that's not that organization, okay, now you can have three pieces that really say, hey, it's bad. You can do the same things that we're doing out on the internet internally and gather this data and have it available. So like Splunk with all the log collection or uh, CrowdStrike with their EDR, understanding all the processes and what everybody's doing, gives you that capability of having both of those things and you can link them together. But this is not a static process, it's constantly changing. Every time we publish something, the threat actor understands how we found them and they're gonna adapt. So then we have to adapt. And that's how some of our um, um, data sets came out. And so when we go back and we look at an investigation, we look for that single thread that might have tied everything together. And that's, for example, how cookies came about. We had the data, but then um, we were able to go back in time for an attack that happened with Turla, where they were sending data through the satellites and picking it up on receivers to, to collect that data. We were able to go back and say, a, cer a certificate, a particular certificate, linked all that infrastructure together. So we're able to go back and say, that should be something that's available to everybody. And we rolled that data set forward for everybody in the world 
uh, and created that. So the, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that we, we talk about and we're going to show, we're going to show you some of those tactic, techniques, and procedures to find these bad guys. And that's the big thing to understand is how can I leverage the um, things that I know and the things that you're going to learn today to help your organization become more secure or to do an investigation better to find all the pieces that you need. So it starts off with having good data. Now, these are the data sets that most of you are familiar with. Passive DNS, what IP address responded to what DNS, to what domain? Who is data? So the who is data is like an address book. It's, it's what IP address belongs to which individual, who it's registered with, and, and who is hosting it. It ties all that together. But with GDPR, that kind of broke it. So that no longer has that, that ability to be such a, a rich data set to link all this infrastructure together. It's all private or it's redacted. So you don't have that information to link it together. But if you, if you have Risk IQ, we have a history. We have over 10 years worth of history. So we can actually go back and look at previous records. Uh, for the free accounts, you're only seeing the current record, but we have history that goes along with that. The DNS information, we had it, but we didn't make it public. Um, and then what we saw happening was threat actors learned, I can't overlap the IPs. If I made this one, it was bad. I don't want to reuse that IP address in a new campaign. So they started to segment out their, their IP addressing and using DNS to do that. So then we made those available to say, hey, show me all of the, um, the conical names, the TXT records, all the different, the MX records, all that type of stuff. So we can link this infrastructure a little bit better to find those pieces um, that might have shown that this threat actor is, is doing that. Subdomains, um, very good to look at. Now we have to remember that subdomains can have completely different infrastructure for every subdomain that's listed. So it's an avenue investigation that most uh, security professionals forget to go down and do that and to look at. Hashes. So the hashes, we take, we get those hashes from like virus total or emerging threats and others, and we bring those in. So the big thing to think about is, what about our advanced data sets? And I'm gonna get into that, but it's all based upon what's in a web page. And so we're gonna go through and explain what's in the web page. You'll see what's there, and then we'll explain those data sets. So if we looked at passivetotal.org, this is how it used to look like. We have a response and a document object model. So inside of here, there's a lot of great information. So with that, we can look at the links and we understand how things link together. So when you think about those host pairs, how things are, are interconnected, this is kind of how we start to build that. So if we have every website and we know all their links and we put those into a database, we're now able to put those together. Um, we get uh, the dependent requests. So for example, when we visited the site, we went to HTTP, passivetotal.org. It was redirected to HTTPS, um, and we see that it was successful. And then we also see that a um, special font from uh, use.typekit.net was used because we have a special font that we like to use. So we can see how that was um, employed, how, how all those pieces are there. And each one of these pieces we can pull out and do something with. Uh, the cookies, so I mentioned the cookies. So here's an AWS cookie and Woopra. So when we have our our chat, like if you wanted to chat and ask a question inside of Passive Total, it's through Woopra, okay? And then we have the certificates. Now, one nice thing is we make the certificates available to everybody. So because who is might not be a good avenue of investigation anymore, um, you can look inside the certificate and inside the certificate, there might be a name, there might be an organization, there might be a telephone number, there might be some things that you can search on inside the certificate to supplement what you used to be able to do inside of the WHOAS record. And so that's why we make that available to you. So the advanced data sets are the certificates, the trackers, that's the little bits of code, Google Analytics, clicky IDs, things like that, the host pairs, the relationships between two domains, what's coming in, what's going out, if it's bringing the style sheets, if you're running a script, if it's a redirect, if it's an image, they're all linked. Um, the web components, what we see running on that website when we visit it, uh, the cookies uh, and the exposed services, these are the ports that we're looking at, the over 220 different ports and the banners that we see. So if somebody has um, port 500, but it shows a banner of Qt FTP, we can say, oh, 
they've changed the port, it's Qt FTP that's running there, and you'll be able to see that. Okay. So with all that data coming in, we have all the links, the the sequence data, the dependent requests, uh, the certificates, the banners, the web components. We're able to build this out, so we can link all this infrastructure together to give you the full picture. So if you're in a trial, you'll see that trackers, components, host pairs, and cookies are um, the advanced data sets that, you, that will work for the trial period, but then after that, you need to have a paid account for that. And we're going to be going through and doing some of these investigations. I'm going to show you some of these advanced data sets that most of you have not played be with before to show you the value of it. So with that, the 14-day uh, history in the free email account and the 90-day history that you see with an organizational email. Okay, and then if you're on a paid account, you get unlimited history and you get all the data sets that are available there. So with that, um, we are going to start off looking at a known good to find some bad infrastructure. So what I'm gonna do right now is I am going to um, go into my browser, bring it up, and we're gonna start, okay? So give me a second. So I'm going to go to community.riskiq.com and I'm going to log in. And when we take a look, this is the new PT interface. On the right-hand side, there's this little toggle to go to the classic PT interface. So let me just explain what we're seeing here. So the threat portal, the new PT interface, gives you the ability to put in a URL, put in an IP address, a name, uh, anything. So I can type in here Iran and I can find anything that we see with Iran. Uh, let's see what's one um, ATP. Let's, let's see. Mage cart. Here's some articles. Uh, I can search for different types of things and bring those up and see. This is like active bad things, so like malware, bad things that are on the internet, I can see if I hit, have a hit on those. But if I do to search for something and I don't see anything, I would still want to go over to this PT Classic and do that search to see additional things that might pop up. So just bear that in mind. So under the account settings, I'm going to go through and show you, this is where you enter that promo code, okay? Um, if you're going to use like Maltigo or or another tool where you can use our the API to bring it bring in Risk IQ data into those products, um, under this user and organization, if you click on that, it will show you your your uh, token and secret that you would use. Okay. Now under the sources, I have a few sources that I've enabled that you probably haven't if you're new to to Passive Total, and you might I might see some data that you don't when you do the search. So for example hybrid analysis, if I click on this, um, you'll see, I'll click on the far side one just so you can see, there might be an API or a token and secret that I might need to enter in order for us when we search for something to go to that other system, grab that information and bring it back to the passive total system. So this is a way for that we can control what you see or what extra data you bring in from other sources into our interface. So uh, these are the ones that I have enabled, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up, um, I have a little text file, and I am going to put in all of the tools that we're going to use today, okay? So I'm going to put that into the chat so everybody can see it, okay? And um, I am going to bring up our first query, and then I'll paste that in there for you. So give me a second. We'll start off with this one. Quick second. Okay. OK, 
Okay, the first thing we're going to look for is LinkedIn.com. Okay, we're going to go through this, we're going to talk about it, and then we're going to go in and find some bad stuff that's targeting them. Okay, um, if we look at, at the real LinkedIn.com, you can see um, many different IP addresses appearing over time. Okay, um, and you can you see this heat map. What this heat map is, is six months worth of time. Um, and each square represents one day. The squares that have a curve on the bottom is the bottom of the month, and the squares that have a curve on the top is the beginning of the month, okay? Now, for threat investigators, we never get timely um, requests. Like somebody doesn't say, hey, there was this fish attack today. It's usually, there was something happened a week ago, two weeks ago, and so you might need to come into a system and filter the data to say, show me that particular period of time. So if I wanted to see a, a particular period of time, I can come in and click on one field. And when I do that, that will filter the results to just show me those, those items. Or I can come in and hold the shift key down and click on uh, another square and show that range of time. So this is a way for you to filter that data results. So instead of having an overwhelming amount of data, you can filter it down to just be a specific window of time. Now, this bottom section, this, this data bar that shows up, is all the data that we have in the system. So I can go back to any period of time and click on a section, and that will now show me that six-month window of time up here, okay? And if I want to go back to what we have today, I can go to the far right, click, and that will show me the last six months for that we're on right now, okay? Now, on the left-hand side, you see some filters. So if I wanted to come through and just see everything that was um, routable, I can click on this little checkbox, and then it will filter to just show me those things. If I click on the checkbox again, it resets it and puts it back. If I don't wanna see something like, I don't wanna see the non-routable ones, I can click on the X, and that will remove them from the screen, from the filter, okay? So this is how you, and if I click on it again, it takes it away. So this is how you you um, enable the filters on the results, okay? So the, the resolutions that are here are the A records. It's, it's the passive DNS, what IP address responded to the domain that was listed, okay? And as I come through, and if I hover over these ASNs, I get a pop-up and it tells me what uh, IP address was responding um, or what 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 um, ASN was was responsible for that that IP range or IP address that was listed there, and then we have some tags, and we we put those in here so you can see it. And you can see the sources of where we got this data from. So if Risk IQ collected the data, or Risk IQ and another partner, or just somebody else in, in general. So you can see some of our, our Risk IQ and emerging threats. Here's Pingley. Here's Alien Vault that they collected some as well. So this gives you the idea of where we're getting this data and how it's it's being presented to you. And most of the time, um, we're we're finding that data, okay? But sometimes we don't. Sometimes passive DNS, because the world's so big and things are changing all the time, um, we 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 share that data with partners and they share their data with us. Now the who is records. Um, let's take a look to see what we have here. So we can see here it's Mark Monitor. Um, we get some history, and as we go back in time, you can see other information that's listed here, okay? So this sometimes is, they're dead sometimes, these avenues of investigation, but sometimes you might have a telephone number or an email address that when you click on it, you can see other records that were registered with those, those resources. Telephone numbers are generally high fidelity because um, some uh, registers require you to have a real telephone number, and um, they'll reuse those, threat actors will reuse those. Now the certificates that we see here, um, we have a lot of information that's in here. So we have what infrastructure they're associated with, their alternative names, uh, the organization, and if you, if you click on one of these, let me show you how it works. So if I click on one, um, that will search now in that certificate and say, here's all the certificates that have that in there, okay? Now there's always a breadcrumb if you click on it that you can go back. Now, the way that I like to do stuff is instead of um, doing the technique where um, I click on something, um, I right click. So if I come back here, I'll, I'll do that same one. I will right click and open in a new tab. 
And what that gives me the capability is when you're doing an investigation and you're on the, the, the trunk of the tree looking at that data, you go down a branch. Well, the branch might end. So you need to be able to go back to the trunk to go to another branch and go down another avenue of investigation. So by doing this type of, of, of thing, uh, investigation with, with tabs, I can save all of my tabs into a folder and have that investigation preserved. Um, but it gives me the ability I can jump back and go back several tabs and go down another path. So I like to do that. Now, one thing I want to mention, I forgot to mention up front, is what we're going to be looking at is this is a live system. So the thing, the bad things that we're investigating are truly bad, and you don't want to go there directly. So like a good seasoned um, um, investigator, we want to use tools that go out and gather the data for us and protect us and protect our organization. Because if you go there directly, you could expose your system and your organization to that threat. So you want to use mechanisms that are out of bound um, with that that threat actor. Something else that's collected that data uh, to be able to, to put that buffer between you and the bad thing. So um, when we start going through these types of searches, um, it's very important to um, look for, uh, make sure that nothing, these, these examples aren't defanged. You wanna make sure that you don't click on it directly. You wanna copy, you wanna paste it in, or you wanna use the links that I'm gonna put in the chat to protect you, because those will be links to our system to be able to show uh, the data in there, okay? So when we we go back to the previous one, um, subdomains, we have a thousand subdomains. Each one of those subdomains can be on completely different infrastructure, different IP addresses, different components, trackers, the whole bit. So um, when you do an investigation, don't overlook subdomains, okay? Now the trackers, um, these are the little bits of code that are running and um, that might be like a, a LinkedIn ID, a Twitter ID, there could be some Google analytic codes. There's over here over 322,000 different uh, things here. The components, now take a look, there's 3,064 um, components here. So the components are what are on the website that, that are running when we visit it. Um, and we can see over time the first and last time that we've seen these, these things here. Now, when you go to a threat actor's infrastructure, Sometimes there might be two components running. It doesn't mean that that's a sign that it's bad, but it's kind of fishy because why would only be two things running? There's usually a bunch of stuff like here, there's 3000 things running. Um, so these solid analytical leads that we talk about as we go through and do these investigations, I'm showing you a good one right now. And then we're gonna start looking at some bad ones and you'll be able to tell the difference and go, hey, that doesn't look right. So you're trying to train your eyes to find these bad things. Um, the host pairs. So this is everything that's, that's linking to uh, linkedin.com. Um, and we can look here and see, hey, there's, there's some scripts, some iframes, different things. So if we look at the causes over here, and if I show more, um, I can see all the different ones that we've identified and even the child relationships that are here. Um, so this is how we build that map to know that infrastructure chain. This is one of the ways, how we know that one domain is related to another domain because there's some sort of relationship between them, like a redirect, a script, an iframe. Um, it could be that the, the style sheets was an Im imported from that place. So we have all those things in there. The open source intelligence that, that was collected on these, uh, all the hashes that were seen, um, and here's some from hybrid analysis and emerging threats. You might not see the hybrid analysis because you don't have it enabled. Um, DNS information, so these are all the DNS records. We see the C names, the A names um, that are listed here, um, and all the cookies. So here's all the cookies that are listed, okay? So the other thing that um, I wanted to show you is um, I also have, we have CrowdStrike, and we have it enabled that we share data with our instance of CrowdStrike. So if I search for LinkedIn.com, there was actually uh, five systems that have reached out to LinkedIn.com. So I can see that during my investigation, did any internal systems touch those? So this is, that's why that's that's there. Now this analyst insights that, that's up on the very top are questions that analysts were thinking about uh, when they look at something new. Hey, is this a new domain? Is it blacklisted? Is it currently, um, um, 
a revolving blacklist where it's on and then it's off. You know, how long ago was it registered? Um, when was the last updated? How many new uh, subdomains? Uh, what's changed? Is it linked to anything else? So these are common questions that you might be thinking about. So we try to populate those up there for you. So um, one way to look at infrastructure is to look at tools that are used um, to duplicate websites. And there's a tool out there, and I'll show you, I'll, I'll bring it up to show you, um, HTT Track. So HTT Track is a web copying tool. So some of you might have used it in your in your professional lives to copy websites. If you're moving something from um, dev to QA, QA to production, it's used. It's used all the time. But threat actors use it because it's a free tool and it's a way to easily duplicate a website. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to look for this to see what websites have have it installed or have used it. And then we there's some um, um, artifacts that are left behind that we can use to, to help our investigation. So give me a quick second and I am going to paste this in and then I'm going to show you how to edit the URL to look for any domain that might have used this. So this HTT track is a component. So every single website here that's listed, um, HTT track was used on it. Doesn't mean it was malicious. It just means that that tool was used on that website okay, the domain that's listed here so um if we um if you if you um you can craft this type of query to um, look for any type of domain so i'm just clicking on one just to show you and then i'll i'll, sh I'll give you the actual way to craft the url to look for a particular domain so if we look at the trackers um we can start to see there's some document-based urls and here's some HTTP um, um, HTT track artifacts that are left behind. There's the website where it was copied from and the host of what was copied, okay? And you have this source right here, this HTTP source host. So if I copy this, okay, and I come up to this list right here, this, this URL, um, if I take out the Ohio piece, okay, I'm gonna take this out. And I am going to put a slash. I'm going to put that source host. I'm going to put another slash. And I'm going to look for Twitter now. So if I do www. Uh, not Twitter, um, LinkedIn, sorry. LinkedIn.com. Hold on. Here it is. I'm going to paste it in. I didn't type it right. Okay, so here it is. So it's trackers, HTTP, source host, and then LinkedIn. So if you search for this now, um, this will now show you every single website that has copied LinkedIn, okay? Um, so, so with that, we can now start to look at these and see if there's anything suspicious or malicious involved with these. So you can see that there's a few of them here that were first seen on the 9th and last seen on the 9th. So these are really new. And here's this log past temp3utilities.com that was on the third. Last time we saw it was on the fourth. So let's look at um, let's look at one. So um, let's look at the past one. So let's look at this one. So if I open this up in another tab. So now the analyst insights tells me something. It says, hey, this was blacklisted six days ago. Okay. It's only been live. Um, it's only been first seen on the 28th, okay, 20th of August. So not that many days. The single IP in the in the US. Let's look at the who is record. Um, as I go through the history, no IP.com. Hmm. Okay, so that means it's a dynamic DNS type of thing. So over time, you know, this is where it was registered. So um there's, it's kind of fishy. Doesn't mean it's bad, but it's kind of fishy. We can look at the emails and see who, the, who it's registered with, the name servers, the phone numbers that here, the organization, okay? And then the certificate. Let's look at the certificate. So if I look at the certificate, I can see a C panel. Okay, this does, it's not suspicious. I can look that there's a ton of 
subdomains associated with this. There's over 3,000 subdomains. Let's look at the trackers. So when we look at the trackers, we can see that it, it copied the website for the Checkpoint LG login, okay? So if I don't do this yourself, because it's not a good idea to do this, but let's take a look at this. So if I open in a new tab, I know that this is not malicious. That's why I'm doing this. It actually shows me how to log in to LinkedIn. So it's trying to, to steal credentials from people, okay? So if we look at the components, there's only four components that are listed here. If I'm a threat actor, why stand up infrastructure I don't want to maintain or configure? So I can see here HTT Track, Amazon Web Services, Apache, and PHP. So it's not the 3,000 that we saw on LinkedIn, it's a significant amount less. So we can look at the host pairs now. So now we can start looking at some of these um, um, relationships that there was an XML HTTP request going to uh, here. And so we can understand a little bit with that. And we can look at the cookies. So if we look at the cookies, we can see, okay, there's just a, a, a PHP session ID. Um, so what does this mean now? I can take this, this information from here. And if I want to see it, there's a couple ways I can do this. I can, if you're a Risk IQ customer and this was in your LinkedIn, for example, you could look at your external threats and see it all packaged up in everything for you because we know what you have and anybody that's duplicating anything that you have, we immediately tag it and flag it and show it to you. But I can go through and use a tool, uh, an open source tool like um, um, URL Scan IO um, and search for this and show you uh, things that are out here. So this one say, hey, it's malicious. Another thing I could potentially do is look at um, the um, safe browsing list from Google, okay? So if I put that, that domain in here, so let's, let's go back and grab that domain. If I copy that and I go to the safe browsing status from, from Google and I put that in, it can tell me, hey, it's it's bad. Uh, don't go there. So this is this is the bad site. So this is some of the ways that you can go through and do these types of investigations. If we go back again to this list and pick one, um, um, and we can use that same technique to see if this is really bad or not. So um, let's grab another one. Let's let's look. Um, I'll grab this one. Let's look. Okay, so it's not blacklisted, it's up. Um, okay, let's look at the who is records. Um, nothing's in here, okay. Uh, let's look at the certificates. Let's encrypt, okay, so it's a free certificate authority, so that's that's potentially something not good. Um, two subdomains, let's look at the trackers. Okay, it's copied that LinkedIn again. Um, it also has a, a Google Tag Manager ID, so let's look what this one is. Uh, a, Yan, a Yandex um, a tracker as well. Let's look at the components. Well, there's 70 components here, a lot more, so it could be legitimate, don't know. Let's look at the host pairs. A lot of parent pages um, coming in, a lot of things coming here. Um, there's 52, so let's go to the next page. Let's take a quick look. Um, some open source intelligence. Um, on this, there's some, uh, we can open up these articles and look at them. Uh, there's five hashes, but let's take a look at the, the Google Safe Browsing. So if I copy this, and let's look at the Google Safe Browsing. Some pages on the site are unsafe. So uh, there could be a, a page in here that's compromised. Okay, so now let's let's go out to the URL scan IO. And let's search. So if I, instead of telling it to go from here, where we'll go out actively right now, I wanna see if anybody in the past has come here and, and told it to search for something. So if I put that domain in and I search for it, um, I can see three months ago there was something in here. So let's take a look. Okay, so um, it's in Russian, so that doesn't help me, uh, but it's a malicious um, thing. So I can probably rest assured that this one is probably also malicious because it's been associated with other malicious activity. 
So the list that you see under here um, for these domains uh, is a good indication that there's something that might not be right, okay? Or your organization has been using it to copy stuff and take it out. So you can use it for anything else. So if you came in here and um, you can look for um, any type of domain and see if there's a hit and then look to see if anybody's copying you. So this is another way of looking at a component and bringing that information to bear to help you uh, in an investigation. Barrett, are there any questions that have come in while I'm doing this example? Benjamin, yes. Let's okay. open up. Um, what was the start point for using HTTP track in passive total? Oh, so the, the, the reason why I did the HTTP track is that when you're looking at your own organization, um, you sometimes have to try to see um, like from a hacker's perspective, what type of things they might do. So they might they might duplicate your site. When they duplicate your site, they will probably duplicate your cookies, your different components. But I wanted to to just see if anybody, this is like low hanging fruit, has duplicated my domains with um, a tool that's out there. You could use Mark of the Web. So if it was a Microsoft um, um, browser, they could have saved your um, um, your site and duplicate it using that method. So these are like the watermarks that are that are in the software to show the source of where this came from. So um, I just picked um, a way of trying to find something active and new by looking at some popular brands and looking at who's been copying them. You could do the same thing for like uh, PayPal objects and different things because people are trying to steal PayPal accounts to, to do fraud. So um, I can show the same example um, using PayPal objects, but looking at the host pairs. So um, I can quickly um, show an example like that um, if you like. So let me let me bring that up real quick and show one of those. So let me show you another way of doing it. So if you look at PayPal, um, you can embed the objects inside of a website to do um, purchasing. But a lot of people will go take um, something like uh, PayPal objects, or, or let's look for www PayPal objects. I think that's a better one. Okay, so let's look at this. So I'm gonna paste this in. So from looking from the legitimate site, um, I can come in here and start to look at um, um, different types of, of links. And if I look at the host pairs, for example, um, I wanna find, ones that might have a, a cause of a script or CSS import. So there's 93,000 that had a CSS import. Um, just by me filtering on the host pairs that people are pulling out my style sheets from PayPal objects, um, you can start seeing the tags right here showing that these are malicious. So if we started to go through, here's the real PayPal, using PayPal objects. But as we go through and we look at these, um, we can find tons of bad stuff that are referencing this infrastructure. So um, let me find a, a good one. Here's one. Here's an example I picked up earlier. So if we take a look at this one, uh, the host pairs shows that it's going out to PayPal objects, okay? But you notice it's only been up for a couple of days. Uh, there's a resolution. Let's look at the, it's IT, so I guess it's Italy. Uh, let's look at the who is information. So we can see it's two cows and over time 2016, there was an actual address in here. So let's open that up in another tab. And um, there's a telephone number. Let's open that up in another tab. Then let's just quickly look. So there's all these um, other ones that are in here. They're older domains. Um, there's a, a pay-pal.business. So this person has probably done other ones. There's an Apple Mac Care, um, two of them associated with the telephone number. But as we go through and we look at these different types of, of pieces in here, it gives us the capability of understanding um, how this data links to other things. So I can look at something and look at the host pairs and filter down to like a script, um, look at the style sheets 
and then try to look at those things to see what's there. Or you can go and look at the, co the cookies, for example. The cookies, this is a session ID, but if there was a tracker, it could have been a PayPal tracker that's in there. And just because they're pulling these things in, they're gonna potentially duplicate those things as well. So this is another example that I can go through and see these. And then um, inside of our backend, when we look at these things, uh, we, we can actually look at the actual dependent requests, the status, the pages, the cookies. This is how we're gathering this data. This is a, a peek in the behind the scenes of how we go out there and we crawl this data and we see it together and how it's been blacklisted. And if it was been added to the Google Safe Browsing, uh, Microsoft Smart Scan, how it was identified, and then even a, a snapshot picture of how it currently, how it looked like when we, we talked to it. So here's the active one of how it looked like when I first did it. It was a PayPal login. Um, so there was um, faking these types of things to get your credentials so then they can go to PayPal and make, make purchases. So this is how you can look at good infrastructure to find bad stuff, either by using a tool that is used to duplicate stuff, that's one avenue, and that was the HD track, or looking at, for example, the host pair information, those relationships, and finding those relationships that don't make sense, like why would someone be copying my uh, CSS, importing it into their site? That doesn't, that's that's not good. And, and linking to find um, that infrastructure. Barrett, any other questions that came up? No, oh, you answered the other one, so we're good for now. Okay, perfect. So then um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this over to Jordan. And um, Jordan, um, I'm gonna share my screen and then... Um, perfect. Well, it's all yours. Okay, cool. Um, actually, if you'll hit the next slide. Okay. Okay, so... Um, we're, we're gonna build off of the examples that Benjamin just showed and um, give you a feel for how you might investigate some domain infringement examples um, if that is something you're seeing in your organization. But before we kick it off, um, I wanted to just give a, a brief overview of what the I3 team is. Um, we keep using the, the term I3. It stands for Incident Investigation and Intelligence. And we represent the managed services component um, at Risk IQ. Um, we have many decades of expertise in both cyber and physical security, and then we are able to essentially leverage all that expertise to apply uh, additional analysis and intelligence on top of the whole suite of Risk IQ products. And um, what we're going to be talking about today actually shows that perfectly. Um, we're going to talk about domain infringement, which we, um, the I3 team, manages um, the external threats platform, and that's one of the modules that we track through external threats. And then we're also going to show I3 can do an additional investigation on top of that information um, to give you some more context and um, background behind a, a domain infringement instance. So with that, I think uh, I'll advance to the next slide, and I will turn this over to Josh. Howdy, howdy. All right. So with this, we're going to be checking out when you see a domain infringement event. What what it really is and how it's going to be affecting you. So a lot of times you might come across a domain that is type of squatted, um, which means they're going to just change the URL just a little bit. So like with LinkedIn.com, what we were looking at before, you might see something where, you know, it's LinkedIn with two eyes. So they're just changing something little to mislead a potential customer or client um, and harm your business. You can also see ones that are just purely registered malicious from the beginning where they might say if we're doing LinkedIn um, example, it'd be LinkedIn sign in dot com or something. So they're actually using your brand or client's name in the domain itself. And they registered this 100 percent maliciously to impersonate or apply affiliation with you. Um, some of the issues that this can cause is, as stated just a minute ago, is, is it can cause damage to your brand and reputation because people are going to be going to these sites thinking that you are affiliated with them or that you own them. And that's not the case. So they can put anything they want on there, redirect you to anywhere they want to their content or any sort of malicious content. Um, it can put your customers' uh, data in jeopardy as they can 
take the credentials from your site, take, um, and credentials from other companies as well, just by going that and using spear phishing, because if they're using something as a typo squat or using a malicious domain, they can send out emails with that final domain. So it might say, you know, HR at LinkedIn sign in.com and your customers are going to believe that that's a legitimate um, email and that also opens up the door to the business email compromises as they can keep digging in and go against your own infrastructure to gather information to harm the business and potential customers yeah and one thing i want to mention is like the linkedin example that i showed you is a good example where somebody can steal the linkedin credentials and you go oh it's just linkedin credentials there's it's, who cares but now they have your contact in rolodex where they can now target um people in your organization or friends or colleagues or affiliates or partners um with these targeted campaigns yeah yeah a lot of times it's just the tip of the iceberg when you're seeing it so it's Always good to be addressing this kind of stuff. As for what you can do, um, the, I, when you originally are coming across it, it's always a good idea just to shoot it out to Google to try to browse or block it, whether that's just content itself or a malicious domain. Um, they're usually pretty responsive with this. They'll do their own investigation and go from there. Um, the next initial step that we usually advise somebody is to work with the registrant because even though they are a threat actor a lot of times if they get caught they'll work with you just to get rid of it so they can clear their name get done with it move on to their next scam that they're going to do but at least your company is safe at that point for that domain um, but there are many cases where they won't um, work with you because as we just said they're a threat actor so they might not play nice. And then at that step, usually with a malicious domain, you're going to work with the registrar themselves. Um, you can find the registrar by using PT, figuring out the contact information for them, and just explain the situation to them. You're going to be telling them how it's a threat, what you needed, why you need it taken down. And oftentimes they'll work with you to put that in client hold status or get that transferred to you, depending on what your final status that you want at that domain. Um, in some cases, if there's not enough infringement on the domain, such as type of spots, even they can be a little 50-50 um, on, um, you can work with the hosting provider to try to get the content itself just removed or the IP nulled. Um, unfortunately, that does usually leave the domain in the threat actor's possession, so they are free to try to move around to another hosting provider, spin some other stuff up, but sometimes it kind of knocks them down where they're, they'll kind of quit playing around. You can either try to purchase it or um, once again, just continue to work with the registrar so you can work in tandem with the two. Is, um, is that is that sync calling? Is that would be an example would be sync calling a domain? Me say one more time. It cut out. Would that be sync calling a domain? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, at, at 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 the point with the hosting provider, they they're not going to do anything outside of the content. So if we can say we're going to IP null it. If the registrar doesn't play nice with us, you're you're kind of stuck and <laughs> moving on to the next steps for that. Um, I, I we've seen many threats come up where the hosting provider will take the content down, and then two weeks later they move to Amazon Web Services or something like that, and then they spin up a new content. Um, so if it's a truly malicious domain, it's always good to try to just get the registrar to put it in client hold status and get that in your possession okay. if possible. So if neither of those are working, if for some reason the registrar is not playing nice, if the hosting provider isn't taking action, another option is always to look at the new generic top level domain registry owner or operator. Um, usually these are owned by companies that you know, are pretty active in making sure that their top level domains are only used for legitimate purposes. So if you reach out to them, they can shut it down. They'll document who's been using this so to prevent future infringement. Um, but usually that's the last step because of it's a little bit slower of a process. Um, they, they, when you're registering with an entire TLD, you, you know, they, they have a lot of complaints and a lot of issues to address. So if all those steps are failing, one of the final steps that you can pursue is uh, going for DRP, so domain resolution policy. And that's when you're saying, okay, well, the registrar is not cooperating for some reason the, the hosting providers not you can work with ICANN 
to try to get proceedings going to just get the domain turned over to you. It's usually a very lengthy process and it's not cheap, but it is usually successful if you have um, some sort of actual legal basis to say these guys are being malicious. <coughs> Wonderful. And Barrett, please let us know if any questions come up uh, for Josh. Um, any specific questions? Will do. Okay. Okay, so in addition to um, working to get the content domain or IP taken down, you can also investigate um, to see what you've got here. And, and oftentimes this is really important because you don't fully know the nature of the threat or the extent of the problem unless you do a little bit of digging into that. So the, the, the three points I really want to make here is when you're, you're investigating, you want to look at the underlying infrastructure then you want to look for patterns across similar domain infringement candidates. So if you are a company that's getting hundreds of, of typo squatted domains popping up all the time, how many of them are connected and might be by one um, threat actor. And then um, at the end, follow following the clues to attribution to understand um, who might be behind it and how to keep a lookout for this in the future. So next slide, please. Um, the example I'm going to talk through today is, is one that we actually did for a client a few months back. Um, so we're just going to refer to it as Domain X, but the infrastructure we're going to talk about, um, we can actually pull it up live. So in the case of Domain X, we started in Passive Total. We saw that it was created a few months ago. We knew it was email capable, which is um, a, a big flag that's concerning. And then it was only resolving to one IP address, this um, .153. So um, if folks want to actually take a look in Passive Total and pull this up from for themselves, I'm gonna, I will. I'm going to grab it real quick for you, uh, or you can use it. So I, I have it right now. I had to kill the the screen for one second so I can get that in here. So here's the res here's the the link. I'm pasting into the chat. If you want to paste them in as well, you can, um, Jordan. Awesome. I'll have to kill the the the. Um, the presentation to, to paste them in. Yeah, no worries. I'm actually gonna, um, while folks are looking um, at this in PT, I am going to um, take over as presenter and, and just pull up my screen so we can walk through it real quick. So as you look through this, be thinking about some of the things that um, Benjamin showed us in the last few examples of what might be alarming as you look at this. And we don't see your screen just yet. Okay, how about now? Yes. Seeing PT? Okay. Awesome. All right, one thing I, I also wanted to mention, because we are um, kind of suspending disbelief and we were investigating this a, a couple months back, um, our domain X is, is not currently a resolution, so you don't have to, to think that the, the single one you see today is what we're talking about, but I do want you to look at this IP as if this resolution was happening today, um, just to see kind of the, the state of play. So if folks want to add anything that they observe in the chat, please feel free. Uh, there's a lot to review here, but I'll start calling out some of the things that stood out to me as I started to look at this. First, we see that it is blacklisted, big red flag, and it's got lots and lots of domain resolutions, not so much as of today, but Historically, you can see there's many going on at a time. And then one other place that I drew my attention very quickly was the, the hashes tab. And I think Benjamin showed um, this, this might be something you need to enable in your settings to make sure that um, you're seeing this when you look through passive total to see some of these hashes, but they're very easy to copy and paste into virus total. So I'm gonna just pop some in the chat in case folks aren't seeing it right now. So here's, here's a couple. And if you move over to virustotal.com, um, which should also have been, I believe, one of the links that um, Benjamin included at the top, but um, you can go ahead and just put some of these hashes right in the search and see what comes back just to get a sense. Um, obviously, we don't need to go through all 1000, but um, just to get a sense of what we've got here. So quickly, we're starting to see, oh, lots of lots of folks calling out Trojans here. 
that's good to know. We'll try another one. And we see the same thing um, as we include a couple more. In fact, I, I went through a good number of these and found almost all Trojans um, for the last few days, at least. So that is, um, you know, all signs pointing towards this is bad. Anybody seen anything else they want to share? OK, one other um, place that I recommend looking at um, is that OSINT tab. And we'll start to see right away we've got things like IBM, we've got um, abuse IP. And if you pull those up, spoiler alert, you're going to see more bad things. We've got uh, abuse reports as of just a few days ago, hacking, fraud, spamming, scamming. And then IBM, um, you can see in the background, this was tagged for phishing. So we don't need to, to dig too much into this, but one other place I really like to um, find open source information on IPs is actually in Twitter. I think a lot of um, rogue researchers enjoy complaining about IP addresses in Twitter. So um, this is a place that I find a lot of good information and it doesn't take much time. Um, I just pasted the link in the chat if y'all want to follow along. But if you ever find an IP and you want to see if someone has put something out about it, of course, Google it, put it in quotes and, and give it a Google. That's going to pull back um, some of the big cybersecurity research um, that's out there. But folks on Twitter will just put it up you know, without without an additional thought. And so you might actually get um, more of a tip off if you, you check here. So I like to comb through here and just see, you know, what have people been talking about? So we've got people saying phishing coming from this IP. Oh, here's a report on this IP. And in this case, they actually notified the, the are, hey, this is related to you. This is super malicious. So um, and that was that was last year. But if you kind of look through Looks like this has been known bad for quite some time, um, since 2016. So this is just a quick, quick way to kind of get a feel for what you've got here. All right, um, I'm actually going to Benjamin give it back to you. you okay. Pull the slides back up. Okay, I'll do it right now. And then I think we can start on slide 59. Okay. Um, actually go one back, sorry about that. Okay. okay. All right, so you, you've now found that you've got some bad infrastructure. Um, it's really important now to look across all of the domain infringement um, events that you might be tracking to see if that's tied to other things. So, you know, if you're a small company and you only get onesies, twosies, this is this is pretty easy. But if you're dealing with large numbers, um, it, it becomes increasingly important to kind of group them to see if this is a campaign. Um, so one thing I wanted to mention is that if if you are trying to do this yourself, you could try a sort of like a DNS twist. Um, there's a GitHub link that we included at the beginning of the chat, and that's going to help. Uh, generate some some variant typo squatted domains that might be related to your brand. Um, but this is also the sort of thing that external threats can do um, in a heartbeat and then continue to monitor. I, I, I believe DNS twist is something you have to proactively um, continue to refresh. So this might get outdated pretty quickly. But if you're you know just trying to get a feel for what's out there, that might actually um, help you. So from there, um, you want to keep track of these. And I think one of the easiest ways to do that is to manage all of your domains in PT so that you can pop them up um, at the drop of a hat and see what's changed very quickly. Um, you can also leverage something like Multigo, um, which we talked about a little bit earlier. The community version is free. And um, I, can't, I can't emphasize this enough if you're trying to communicate with um, executives at your own company to kind of underscore what the problem or issue is, having a visual clutch. So highly recommend. Um, and then of course you can leverage Risk IQ's external threats. This is something that um, we excel at. But just wanted to give you some of the options here if, if that's something you're trying to track. So 
tying this back to domain X, when we looked at that bad infrastructure, and then I looked across to see, um, was this was this bad IP tied to anything else? It turns out it was actually being used by 11 other domain infringement candidates um, targeted against that brand. So pretty quickly, we can get a sense for, you know, this is probably not a one-off. This is probably targeted, um, and that's something we need to keep track of. So now we can lump these together and say, this is probably all um, a singular threat. Next slide, please. And then you want to keep digging into that infrastructure. Um, when it was first created, Domain X resolved to an Amazon IP address, and many of the same red flags presented as the one that we just searched. I found a ton of negative OSINT um, connecting it to botnet and malware activity. So right off the bat, I'm thinking, uh-oh, um, this is probably also part of that. It was on the block list, and then go figure an additional 10 um, domain infringement candidates on top of the 11 we found for the last one were tied to this, this second Amazon-owned IP. And so all of these red flags, I'm thinking, no bueno. We've probably got um, some malware that we need to be concerned about. Um, but it's important to recognize that when you do any investigation, you're going to have to kind of go through some rabbit holes, and you're always going to be researching more than the, the um, the takeaways you get. And so in this case, I I looked through external threats to see those crawls, um, but you can also find this in passive total host pairs. It turns out that those 10 that I was looking at are actually all for sale, which is good news, especially if you are a company that wants to do proactive or defensive um, domain purchases. So that's actually great to know. Um, but when I looked through that, it, you know, it quickly became clear, oh, these are not these are not at present um, spewing malware, they're actually for sale. Um, and that was just a, a thing that I had to kind of keep digging till I found it. Um, but wanted to call out, everyone is gonna go through rabbit holes as you do these investigations and that that really is part of it because you might find gems like this. I initially was disappointed and thought, oh, oh bummer. You know, it actually is not um, something salacious to report, but it, you know, this is actually really beneficial for clients um, to know when things are for sale because that might be um, a purchase they wanna make. Next slide, please. Okay, so looking at the 11 that we tied to the IP address that we researched in Passive Total, um, I started to look at what was common between all 11. And all 11 were privacy redacted, their who is information not there. Um, and a handful showed a previous resolution to a third common IP. So that again supports our theory that this was likely part of a connected campaign that they've been moved in bulk um, between different pieces of infrastructure. And then that third IP is now something that I can follow up as a new lead for additional research. Next slide, please. Okay, so I, I titled this one, Don't Overlook the Obvious, because although the 11 that I, I just pointed out all had privacy redacted who is information, it turns out domain X had real info um, in the who is registration. And although that is becoming increasingly um, less common, it still does happen. So definitely take advantage of the selectors and the bio data you find there. Um, like Benjamin mentioned, even if it is privacy redacted, sometimes those phone numbers um, or addresses will give you leads. Um, in this case, we had a name, email address, phone, and address. And so what I wanted to do is um, take the same tactic that I took on the infrastructure, but then look at the people route because you can change infrastructure just like you can change a phone number. But if we kind of get all of those pieces and we're, we're monitoring for all of those, we're a little bit more likely to see the, um, the campaigns and the commonalities as they evolve. So thing, I stayed within PT. I think it's really important when you are um, trying to investigate and exploit the information in a tool to, to kind of finish out and pull all the information you can um, in that tool before you move on, because this is the sort of thing that you branch off into a million different threads. And if you set any of this aside and you come back tomorrow, your brain will hurt. You won't remember where you left off. So um, I actually searched Mr. Kim here in Passive Total. There's a, the in the search bar, you can just search for who is name. And I just searched for that directly. Turns out this individual is tied to thousands, I think about 8,000 um, different domains. And obviously you don't need to go through all 8,000, but if you start clicking around, um, it quickly became apparent that 
there was another email address and another um, physical address that were used interchangeably with the ones we saw at the top. Next slide. So before we get too deep in the weeds, I, I do also want to preface because I'm sure some people are thinking, is it really worth it to go through all this extra trouble? And I, I want to say that um, it really depends on the, the question and the challenge that you are you're trying to solve. If you are a company that has on off here or there um, domain infringement, um, perhaps you don't need to go this extra step. But if you feel like you're actually being targeted by a threat actor and you really are trying to get a grip and a, a handle on the stuff and be proactive, then it, it may actually be worth your time to go through. Um, I'll also add that if you have um, third party data sets or tools, um, of course, you can kind of breeze through this research potentially faster. But as we go through the rest of this, I'm really focusing on um, things that everyone can do, and that is a lot of Google. Um, you, can, you can get quite a bit of information and um, extrapolate from what you can find just out on the open web. So I'll, I'll preface that or preface with that and um, just add that if you want to do additional digging on your own or if, if what we go through today is not enough, there's always another level. Um, but we're just gonna go through a few things here to show you how you can continue to collect additional selectors that might be used in these registrations um, to track over time. Okay, so the first thing that stood out to me here was that first email address domain co at neighbor.com. Uh, folks actually wanna Google this themselves Neighbor.com was not familiar to me, so I needed to look that up. And initially I thought, ooh, interesting. I wonder if this is like a, a corporate email address that perhaps this individual is tied to. So I, I did a little bit of research on Neighbor and quickly found this is actually a South Korean platform. It has its own search engine and it offers um, the ability to create email addresses much like Google or Gmail. So that one, probably not super helpful. Um, next, I wanted to look at that phone number, and before I did a ton of digging to see if it was tied to anyone else out there, um, I wanted to know if this was a, a mobile that someone would actually carry around with them, or if this was a landline or a VoIP. So if folks want to actually visit that Wikipedia link, I, I'm going to pop that back in the chat so you can pull that up. Take a quick peek in there and let us know if you think that this is a mobile landline or a VoIP phone. Um, I, I already did the legwork to look at the country code. It is a South Korean phone. Um, but if you want to dig through there, you'll be able to kind of parse that out. This is um, something that most countries have a numbering scheme for phones. So if you do want to get this detailed, um, a lot of this information is out there. You just need to identify the country code first, which is usually the, the first one or two numbers. And then the next chunks of numbers can tell you different things. So this is where I started here. If anybody comes up with the answer, feel free to put it in the chat. Barrett, have we gotten any answers there? Jordan, none yet. Okay. All right, well, I will, I will give you guys the short version, which is it is a VoIP phone. Um, and this is helpful to know because it means this person can ditch this phone at any time and that we might need to look for additional numbers in the future. It may also mean that the person has other phones now that we can find. The next thing I did is look at this address um, that was included in the domain X, who is registration info. So I put this in Google Maps and sadly, it did not come down to a um, particular location. It gave me a street, which is something, um, but not a ton else I can do there except add this address to my list and um, keep an eye out for it in the future. Next slide, please. Give me one second. Okay. Sure. Okay. I also looked at that second address that we found um, through some of the other who is registrations for Mr. Kim. And this was in Victoria, British Columbia. 
So I gave this a Google, and if you're following along at home, I encourage you to do the same. Um, and, and particularly look to see if you can find anything on this address on real estate websites. I'm, I'm talking detailed anything, um, photos specifically. On Google, I was only able to find the street view. Um, there's really nothing there for Ariel. And it stood out to me very quickly. This has got, this is a, a residential address. It's got a call box, a camera, and a large security gate. And I, you probably can't even see it. The house seems so, so set back um, that you can't really make it out from the street. So that's interesting to me. And it, it suggests that the person here is possibly pretty security conscious. But also when I gave this address a Google, I found it tied to Mr. Kim. Um, you can see in the, the screenshot I took here on a, a website called Locate Family. This is interesting because it starts to suggest that Mr. Kim might actually be a real person, maybe not a fake name. Um, this Locate Family link also included a Canadian landline. It's uh, this number here, 125, that's how it starts. And of course, when I searched that, I found yet another link. Um, and I'm actually gonna pull it up to show you because it's, it's a little bit buried in there. So let me take this back from you. Okay, so you want me to make you present it real quick? Please, that'd be great. Okay, one second. Okay. Okay, can everyone see my, my screen here? Yes. Awesome. All right, so I, I mentioned this in the slide, but when you're searching phone numbers, um, search different variants of them. And it turns out when I dropped the country code, second hit was this one called Import Genius. And I didn't really know what to make of this at first. Um, and we've already talked about rabbit holes. You always need to kind of be aware not to let yourself go too far, um, but sometimes you do kind of have to dig around a little bit. And so I started skimming some of this information. You know, I'm seeing importing info. All right, none of this seems super relevant to me. Um, and even as you go down, you know, a lot of details doesn't seem super relevant. But if you click over to this company tab, all of a sudden we have a supplier and an importer. First thing that stood out to me is a new address in Victoria which is where that the second address we searched um, was also located. And it's registered to Mr. Ken with, what do you know, the Canadian landline we just searched. So that's where this was hitting in Google. And then over here for Goy Media, this other company, we see a new address, but it's in the same district and city as what we found in Whois. So that's, that's interesting. Um, but then of course, this VoIP number that we searched at the beginning is also here. So we can be kind of confident that Mr. Kim is likely tied to both sides here, um, this the supplier side, Goy Media, and the importer side, Magic Flowers Gifts. So we can go back to the, the slides now. I just wanted to show you that because sometimes it, it does kind of get lost in web pages, and um, I know I am, I'm one to kind of give up when I don't see something early, but it does kind of behoove us to take our time and, and look through these. Give me a quick second. Yep, of course. Okay, that's amazing. That's like the coolest thing. It's like it links everything together with your full investigation. Yeah. So if you if you hit the next slide, um, here I've got consolidated all of the info that we can now tie to Mr. Kim. And this is this is important because you want to have a master list as you look through um, domain infringement candidates. Um, so that you're not missing things, because if I had just searched on Domain Co. in Passive Total, I would not have pulled back all of the other domains um, tied to Mr. Kim. Um, and turns out I searched the companies that we just found, and Goy Media is actually tied to thousands of additional domains in Passive Total that I hadn't seen prior. So again, when you are tracking something that you think is a, a real problem, a large scale campaign, and you're trying to kind of wrap your head around it, um, it does behoove you to go the extra mile and, and look both at the infrastructure and the people side. Um, any questions on that? So, so I have a quick question, Jordan. So when you, when you have a telephone number and there's, and it's in a foreign country, do, are there, are these Wikipedia things set up for all the countries or, or it's hit and miss? Um, it's, there's, there's good odds that they will be there. I will just say that not every country follows a logical numbering scheme. 
Okay. Um, so you do have to just kind of search it and see what's out there. There will be times when um, you cannot find from open source what sort of phone number this is, but um, many countries do have really logical numbering schemes. And so it's always just, you know, it's worth a, a quick search just to see if something's out there. Um, it doesn't take too much time and it's, it's free info. Very cool. You didn't call any of the numbers, did you? I did not. No, I did not. <laughs> You're welcome to try, though. No, no, no. <laughs> so um, with that, I, I'll turn it back over and, and just add one additional point, which is um, this is the same sort of lens that we, we, meaning I3, bring to any of the investigations we're doing, whether this is a domain infringement or um, a threat attribution to an executive in your company following these sort of steps and um, checking our assumptions is really key to the, the products we produce. So I'll turn that back over to you, Benjamin. Thank you. And, and Jordan, John, really, sorry, yeah. jump in, Benjamin. Uh, Jordan, really quickly, we had a question about uh, what site was, uh, did you use to find that address again? Um, the most recent one, the Import Genius one? Yeah, uh, the home address and that we we're looking at in, um, for Mr. Kim with the family member, of the key. yeah. Ah, uh, got it. Um, it was locate family, and you can find it. At least I think this is what we're talking about. I'm sorry if I have this totally wrong. Yeah. Um, if no, you right. okay, if you search um, the address I just put in the chat, this one we pulled from Passive Total, and then we just gave it a Google to see. One, is this a real place? Um, is this a residential home? And then can we find any additional context around it? And then when I Google that address, there is a link that will come up on Google that is called Locate Family. And that ties um, in, in open source, not just in um, who is registrations, Mr. Kim with that address, as well as a Canadian landline. Got it, perfect, thanks. Sure. Jordan, this is this is the type of thing that um, as we're SOC analysts and doing investigations, we don't ever we, we generally don't go into the attribution phase and it's hard, um, but it's so nice to see somebody that knows how this works and what needs to happen to really piece the investigation from from the virtual computer realm into the, the real world. And it's it's amazing to see how you tied this to a physical address and to a person and um, brought the full loop of, of the investigation to an attribution to say, no, this is the person, this is where they are, this is this is their address and telephone. That's incredible. Thanks, it's it's uh, fun being a little bit of a, an online stalker. <laughs> but but this is this is the piece that that uh, most of us don't get to see. And this is why it was so important to have um, you and Josh come and talk to us today because we generally, once we find the infrastructure, we're, we block it, we do something, we turn it over to legal, and we're done. But now, um, taking this to another aspect, if if somebody um, needed to use services from i3, how does that work? And is it is it per how how is it? I I know that you can you explain like what the tokens are that i3 uses for investigations and kind of a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So. Um... In addition to managing some of the, the products I mentioned, like external threats or executive guardian, we do also offer um, a service called Advanced Investigations, and it is a, is a subscription um, that gives you access to uh, a senior analyst on our team. Um, it counts for a handful of hours, and so most clients will get several tokens a month that they can um, essentially leverage us for any additional investigations on um, a threat actor that has maybe taken an action against someone at their company or um, done something online that they, they want a little bit more help with. Um, we can also do things like sentiment analysis, um, geofencing, um, giving a, an overview of new threats in that industry. So all those sorts of things. Um, it, it really is a, a boutique custom service, and we, we work to make sure that every month those clients are getting something that's beneficial and useful to them. We don't hope that an incident happens or a breach happens that they need us, um, but it does give them access to us should they, should they request any of that additional information. 
and, and you can do threat assessments as well for an organization or an individual as well, correct? Yep, absolutely. So, so it's so a lot of people don't know when they really need a service like I3, but let's say that you're a startup and you're coming up with the new coolest thing. Um, if somebody steals that information or that idea, your business is done. So it's never too soon to get involved with somebody like I3 to help you uh, figure out what you have, how to protect it and safeguard it for the longevity of your organization and your executives. So um, that's why I wanted I3 to come and show what they do because they do this day after day, every day. Uh, and get to the attribution phase. You know, like for what, what I do and what I show, we never get to the attribution phase. We get to, here's the infrastructure and we're done. So I wanted you to see that the investigation really isn't over at that point. Um, you really need a seasoned professional that has done this for, for their living uh, to show how to do those attributions and to tie it to uh, the physical reality of where these threat actors are and what they're doing and why they're, what's their motivation behind it? What are they trying to do? Um, it's amazing, and and um, I, I you're you're welcome back, Jordan and Josh, anytime to to show us some of these skills and show us some of these investigations because it's fascinating. It's like to me, it's like it's like watching a a movie, an adventure movie. It's it's really cool. It's the reality of of what we all strive to become in our industry. Um, you're doing it every day, so thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, Barrett, were there any questions that came up um, uh, for takedowns? Um, we do have a question for Jordan. She was talking about uh, going down rabbit holes. Uh, we had multiple questions come in asking, you know, how do you determine where to draw that line? And, you know, when do you stop? How far is too far? And, well, that's a great question. Um, I, I think you really need to understand the question you're trying to answer. And then as you continue to research, focus yourself back on that and, and ask, is this helping me get towards answering that question? It might be interesting info, but if it's not helping you answer the question, perhaps you need to set it aside, come back to it you know, out of your own time when you, when you have time to be curious. Um, but you know, really focusing on what you're trying to do in this case, we were trying to, one, is this is this domain something we need to be concerned about and is it um, a targeted campaign? And, and so throughout that process, you know, we were able to use passive total, say, yes, it is. And then, yes, it is. It, you know, this is a this is likely a targeted campaign. Um, and then in order for your organization to be proactive about that and connect additional pieces to it, that's where you just need to amass all the different selectors um, to make sure that you're not missing things. So. I could have very well gone down um, a whole other angle with um, investigating Mr. Kim. Of course, we could look for social media. We could um, research this person 10 ways to Sunday, but if it's not helping me answer the question, then it might be worth setting aside for a future time. Um, but of course, document everything you do. I think anytime you are researching anything and in any capacity, document it even in your own internal notes because so much of this work is iterative. It's iterative research. You find something, you make note of it, and then you might need to research it in a different way, or like I mentioned with phone numbers, searching variants. So make sure that anything you do, you just make a note to yourself that I searched it in this platform in this way, um, so that in the future, if you do need to come back to that, to, go, to break off in a different tangent, you know where you've left it and you know what information you already have. So that's a long-winded answer, but that's kind of how I do it. Jordan, I have another question. So like for a client, if you were going to be doing this report for them, once this report is generated, what are the steps that you do when you present the report or the findings or the documentation that you give them? Yeah, so so um, we would write really all of our findings up here. We want everything that we give a client to be really actionable and not not force them to read you know, 20 pages just to understand what we're saying. So we try and keep this um, short, sweet, but thorough to show here are all the things that we did and here's what you don't need to worry about because we, we took care of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so for this particular client um, for Domain X, we documented all of this, the same steps that we showed today and then gave them um, 
an assessment at the top of what we thought was happening, as well as an, a paragraph called avenues for further, further investigation. So if they had questions or if they wanted more, here are some suggested angles that we could take this. Um, mm -hmm. So anything we do, as I mentioned, you can, you can keep researching your heart out. Um, so we include some of the, the places that we think might have the, the most interesting info and then say, if you need to take this further, here's something that, that we could do for you or you could even look at on your own if you'd like. So have any of these investigations turned into, um, um, turned them over, the client goes, hey, we want you to talk to law enforcement? Um, that hasn't happened to my knowledge, um, but takedowns certainly. Um, okay. And Josh, perhaps, perhaps you can speak more um, to the law enforcement angle. I'm not sure if that has come up too much on your side. Once we're, you get respected law enforcement involved, usually it's going to be something that takes quite a while to do anything on. Um, I mean, the higher level you get, if you're working with a registrar, it's usually a pretty a registrant. A lot of times it's quick because they just want it out of their name. Once you get to the re registrar, it can be anything, you know, 24, 48 hours, 72 hours within days okay. is what you're looking at. Um, once you start going on those higher levels, though, as soon as you turn it to DRP, anything like that, you can stretch that into weeks. And if they press back or fight to say, oh, no, I have a legitimate use for this, you can't take this away from me, then it can become a lengthy battle of that can last into months. But usually, I would say, from my personal experience, when, when you're working on these, if you have anything that is legitimately infringing, you can expect it down within a week. Okay. And it's blocked on the blacklist immediately. So then you have protection for people not visiting, but it might physically be up for a period of time until it's taken down. Okay. Hey, Josh, related to what you were just talking about and timelines for the uh, takedown process, uh, which was great because someone was just asking about how long it takes, uh, but what's the best approach to, to accelerate takedowns? I mean, it, really, you got to gauge based on what the content is itself. If, if it's a type of squat domain that's email capable, it's a lot harder to, ha the hosting provider is not going to care, the regist uh, uh, registrar might care, but they're going to push back because they're going to say, well, we don't see anything, we won't see email headers, we won't see evidence that it's being used maliciously. Um, so it, it's really dependent on the situation. Most of the time for me, I've always found that the registrar is the best way to go with anything maliciously. Um, registered though. Um, if you're trying to get it down quick, just reach out to them, give them all the details you can, all the stuff that Jordan was relaying. If you have stuff like that that you can lay out to them, they're going to take action. Um, I mean, unless you just get one that, as we call it, are hacker friendly, because you do come across uh, registrars across the world that they legitimately don't really care what's what we're setting. Um, and that's where DRT gets involved, where we can try to get uh, pressure on them to work with us. Got it. Cool. Thanks, Josh. You know, I think we have a time for another question here. Uh, Jordan, talking a little bit about the I3 and the the expertise, the other expertise that the team has, but I've got a question about, can you give us a couple examples of RiskIQ products uh, at, where I3 lends its expertise? Sure. Yeah. So in addition to um, research like domain infringement or threat attribution, which we've just talked about, um, I3 can also do um, additional research and investigation for our clients. I'll, I'll just name a couple. For Executive Guardian, we do a fully um, analyst-driven product called Risk and Vulnerability Reports, where we scour the internet for an executive's presence to determine both their cyber and their physical vulnerabilities. Um, and we're looking for things that are both out there that could be exploited, as well as things that are out there that could cause a threat actor to want to exploit them. Um, and we package that up in a way that is not meant as a scare tactic, but very much um, a snapshot in time. It's an awareness tool to show here's what's out there and here's the connections that someone could make if they had malintent. So that's, that's one thing. Um, we also leverage our expertise um, to augment a uh, digital footprint and for our clients using digital footprint to um, track their their own infrastructure internet internet facing infrastructure um, we can kind of contextualize the threat environment for that client both in terms of their industry as well as um, 
this day and age. What's going on in 2020 and some of the cyber threats today are very different than the end of 2019 um, with the rise of COVID. So we can really place a lot of that stuff in context. Um, but we also add in a human element by looking at um, a company's exposures in terms of emails on deep and dark web. We can also look for um, any sort of clues, like, like we just mentioned that someone might have registered um, company infrastructure with personal names or personal email addresses, and then show a company, here, here's why this person um, could be compromised. Here are some of the ways that a threat actor, if motivated, could take advantage of that situation. So those are just two examples, but um, like I mentioned, I3 is um, really geared to be an extension of our client security teams. And so we, we aim to please um, however the client needs us. You can either augment or uh, replace or, or uh, fill in the gaps to extend the capabilities of the teams that, that are out there. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect, thanks guys. Well, that's all the time we have questions for today. Uh, we'll follow up directly with those of you who asked questions we weren't able to ask live. Uh, if you do have any other questions, you can always reach out to success at riskiq.net with more questions. Uh, thank you to Jordan, Josh, and Benjamin for a great workshop. Finally, thank you to all of you for attending, and everyone have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.